I've been seeking God the whole week and I'm saying, Lord, what am I going to share? What is it you want me to say to your people? And just like he does in the Bible, he usually shows up at the last minute. So the whole of the week, I'm saying, Lord, what will I share? What will I share? And there was no word coming. I'd given up and gone to bed last night. Then he told me, um, go up there. I'm going to tell you what to preach about. So at 1.20 a.m., he gave me this word, the call to maturity. Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 11. It says, and he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we from now on be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. Hallelujah. I'm reading from the King James. We are required. It's not just, it's not just a request. It's a requirement. We are required to get to a place of maturity. There must come a time, the, the whole function of having prophets and apostles and teachers and all these gifts in the church is so that we come to a fullness. So there is supposed to be a place where we have reached in maturity. We are supposed to grow beyond being children. He says that, from, that we from now on be no more children. Hallelujah. That we may cease to be children. Hebrews chapter 5. A friend of mine used to ask me, he used to say, um, according to the Bible, who is supposed to make the coffee? And he said, the man. I said, why? He says, because Hebrews. It took me a while to figure it out. I was like, huh? Yeah, he brews. So he's the one who makes the coffee. But now Hebrews chapter 5, from verse, from verse 11. Actually, from verse 10, it says, Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to explain, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when that time for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of solid food. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have, the, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says, everyone that uses milk is what? Unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. Now, I know the English has changed over time. When they said he's a babe in the, in the, in the old English, they didn't mean that he's a young, good-looking girl. They meant he's a baby. The English has changed over time, and now we, when people say the babe, we think something else. But the Bible is saying, everyone that uses milk is unskillful. And he's, and he's pointing out, he's saying, look, we have many things to say, and these things are difficult to explain. But he's saying, the problem is this. At a time when you ought to have grown to a level when you are the ones teaching, you need to be taught the first principles all over again. 
And this is the tragedy of the church. That so often we are stuck in teaching the first principles. Non-stop. And so he says, because you are dull of hearing, there comes a level, a point at which we must leave the first principles and go on to the harder things, to strong meat. He says, strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Hallelujah. Strong meat. Hallelujah. Now this is what happens to a lot of people. Now some people go to places where there is strong meat when they are still children. And so they suffer spiritual indigestion. The bodies can't process. And so what happens is they get offended. And they get offended. It's not because the message is wrong. It is because they were not ready for it. They are too young for the message. One of the things that amazed me is when you go on to chapter 6 and 7 and he, and he's, because now at that point he's begun teaching them the, the strong meat, is where you find principles, is where he talks about things like how Abraham gave the tithe to make Lizedek and other things. A lot of the time, we try and teach principles to people who are not ready for them. Things like the tithe, you don't teach the tithe to young Christians because they'll think you just want their money. You teach the tithe to adult Christians because they are ready for strong meat. There are other principles in here that he teaches about how Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But he's saying, look, we must go beyond this place. Let's move to chapter 6 of Hebrews. He says, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go unto perfection. Hallelujah. He says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Now remember in Ephesians he said that he gave gifts unto them that they may be made what? Perfect. So he's now saying the way to go on to perfection is when you have left the first principles and you're now moving on to perfection. Please, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. So all of these things he's mentioned are first principles. So you know you're not mature if you still need to be taught these things. If you've still not come to a place of having faith towards God, you're still a babe and skillful. If, if you're still struggling with understanding repentance from dead works, you're still a babe. You're unskillful in the use of the word. If you're still having issues understanding baptisms, and he says baptisms, plural, meaning the one of water and the ones of the Holy Ghost and the one of fire. Baptisms. And the Bible says you baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So those are two different baptisms. And of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. These are foundational principles. But there must come a time when you have grasped these things and it is time to just move on to deeper things. And, say, and this we will do if God permits. And then he begins to teach them the deeper things. But in order to go on to the deeper things, you must first come to that place of maturity. You must have come to a place where you can eat strong meat. No one gives babies strong meat. You can actually kill them when you give them strong meat. I remember in those days when we used to fast, there was a, a young man, 
at the university where I was who fasted for 40 days. The problem is when he was done with fasting, he was so hungry, he went and had some really solid food. Um, there is a local dish, we call it posho. Uh, the Kenyans call it ugali, but it's made from maize, maize flour. And stuff to digest. So he had ugali and, and beans. He ended up in the hospital. Because his body hadn't seen food for 40 days. He'd been drinking water only. He was so sick. When you give strong meat to those that are not ready, that's what happens to them. So one of the principles, one of the things we must understand as ministers is this. First, you must be able to tell at what level the people you're ministering to are. What they can receive and what they cannot yet receive. But two, you don't leave them there. You must take them to the place where finally they can receive the strong meat. So many times we get people who are caught up in the merry-go-round. All they want to teach is foundational principles year after year after year after year. They think that is the full gospel. It is not the full gospel. We are the International Full Gospel Fellowship. We preach the full gospel. So at some point, we have to go beyond repentance from dead works, beyond faith towards God, beyond baptisms, beyond laying on of hands, beyond resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, beyond teaching about those things. At some point, we must go beyond that and begin to teach deeper things. It's part of the full gospel. It's, it's part of getting to perfection. And here is the thing about strong meat. Milk is easy. You just drink it and that's it. It's very easy. Strong meat requires some chewing. There is chewing involved with strong meat. You chew on this thing and you chew on it and you chew on it until it becomes soft. Then you swallow. Now what happens is when we've gotten used to milk, Milk is simple. You open your Bible and you read something and immediately it makes sense and that's it and you're very happy. Then there comes strong meat. You read a verse and you're confused. That's strong meat. It doesn't mean that you're no longer in the spirit. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is no longer speaking to you. No, no, no. This one requires you to take some more time chewing chew on it a little bit longer. It is strong meat. You don't just gulp it down. You chew on it. Nobody chews on milk. You don't see someone with a gallon of milk and they are busy chewing. No. They just swallow. But meat is chewed upon. There are some principles here. Sometimes you read a chapter and you're just left blank you're still not understanding anything. And you're thinking, sometimes, I used to go through seasons when I would say, I think the Holy Ghost has left me. I used to get revelations every time I opened the scripture. Now I've opened the thing, I have not understood the thing. No, I need to chew on it. I need to chew on it. That's maturity. You chew on it. You chew on it. You think about it. You meditate on it. You research. You read more. You go backwards a couple of verses. You go forwards a couple of verses. You change versions. You go and read the, you know, you say, hmm, this word. Maybe you go and find out what it says in the Greek. That's chewing. Strong meat. That's maturity. That is maturity. So sometimes what used to happen to me is I used to skip these parts. You'd get to some parts and they're just... <sighs> I just skip and go to the things that I can, you know, easier deal with. Until God brought me to the place of... There was a time I spent a season in Ezekiel, in temple measurement. You know those chapters that talk about cubits and, and, and the like? Oh! I used to skip them. Because 
it was just so boring reading on the porch shall be five cubits by how many cubits by how many cubits and these chapters and chapters of cubits. Then one time the Lord took me through a season of cubits. It's amazing the revelations I found in there. Another time I was chewing on genealogies. And it's amazing the things that are in there. For example, I was reading Moses' genealogy. Do you know that Moses was born out of incest? The Bible says, And Amram took Joshebed, his father's sister, to wife. And then he had Moses. I said, Oh, okay. But then, as I was reading it, the Lord said, Yeah. So you need to understand. That was a time when I was getting so caught up in these strange doctrines about um, generational curses and all so many things. And I was taking them too much. They'd become too much for me. And the Lord told me, Mr. Do you know where Moses came from? He came out of incest. Didn't I use him? I said, oh, Okay said so stop sitting there and people are telling you now you see because of the other now there is the other curse and this other one and then the other curse and you need to break this one and then break the other one then break this one and break the other one you can spend the rest of your life breaking but I found it in the genealogy and it was after chewing on it I said oh he said yeah and this is the same Moses who later gives them the law that says hey thou shalt not the very thing he was born out of. Hallelujah. We are required to grow. First Corinthians chapter 3. says, and I, brethren, from verse 1 to verse 3, it says, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. For you are yet carnal while there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? So one sign of immaturity, envy. When you are still subject to envy, you have not yet matured. When you are still subject to strife and divisions, you have not yet matured. You are still a babe. So the call to maturity requires us to go beyond these petty things, these carnal things, envying, strife, divisions. It says, are you not carnal and walk as men? Maturity requires us to go beyond carnal things. One of the things they mentioned among the foundational principles was what? He said faith towards God. Why is he saying that? Maturity means you've come beyond the place where you need to believe God for a house and a car. Because those are kind of things. They are still part of the other foundational things of faith towards God. You've come to a place where you understand that look I am in God. You know the promises, you know how to claim them, you no longer need to be taught that stuff. You've gone beyond that level. Because there is more to God. God is, you know, some imagine a God of the whole universe and he's sitting there and he's wondering, these people, don't they grow up? All they do is come, Lord, now, now I need the other new designer shades that I saw. Now, Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this. Give, 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 give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That you've gone beyond carnal things. Not that you don't need them anymore, but 
you you've gone beyond your relationship with God is such that you know it's a minor thing you have the assurance you have faith towards God it's coming it's when you come to pray it's somewhere at the bottom of your list because you know it's very simple it's not a big deal you have grown beyond carnal things so the call to maturity requires us to go beyond carnal things and beyond divisions and beyond strife and beyond the other one talked about me. Now this one did this to me. Now the other one. And then I passed him. And I had, I had him mention my name. He must have been talking about me. You've gone beyond that level. You don't have time for petty stuff anymore. Your prayers too have gone beyond carnal things, petty things. That's maturity. You know, sometimes we are so caught up in ourselves that we are constantly carnal. What are carnal things? See, the Bible talks about carnality. Carnality is mentioned multiple times in the Bible, and it's always contrasted with spiritual. So which means that carnal things are physical things. Paul uses a scripture where he says, Shall you not then minister in carnal things unto them that feed you spiritually? Which means that they who preach and teach you the word and you meant to meet their physical needs. Which means that he equates physical stuff or this stuff here that we need with, with carnality. They are carnal. So when your faith, when your relationship with God has gone beyond stuff, you've, you're growing into maturity. When it's no longer, Lord, I am praying for that promotion. Then after you've believed for the promotion and it has come, you're like, Lord, now I need the pay raise. Then after the pay raise has come, you're like, Lord, now you see, um, I need to make sure this goes away. I need to pay off the other debt. Carnal things. I says, but you're still carnal. I couldn't. I couldn't speak to you unto, as unto spiritual. Because you are not able to bear strong food. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 2 verse 2. Actually from verse 1. It says, Therefore laying aside all malice and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speaking, as newborn babies, or oh, actually my what I say is, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So the milk is for your growth. That milk, and you see, it's for, as newborn babes. Newborn babes do not remain newborn babes year after year. They grow. You know, it, it used to amaze me. A year after getting married, I still had people who were referring to us as newly married. And I used to look at them like, no, I'm not newly married. I knew too many people who had gotten married in the intervening time. But some of us, you know, like to keep that thing. So we want to remain babies. Why? Because, you know, when you're a baby, everyone's caring about you. There's a lot of attention. Babies are always crying for attention. Maturity means you've gone beyond crying for attention. Maturity means you've gone beyond pray for me over this and pray for me over that and pray for me over this and pray for me over that. You, you don't cry. Those who've got, gotten mature know how to go to the store and get stuff. They don't stay in the bed and cry until someone figures out the baby is crying, is hungry. No, they know how to go to the store and buy the stuff and cook it and then eat because they are hungry. Or how to go to the fridge and pick it and eat it because they have matured. There is a level you get to in God. It's not that he's suddenly become meaner. No. It is that you have grown and he's no longer, and he's expecting 
expects you to put some effort into these things. You have grown. So he expects you. Or he expects you to have grown. So he expects you to put some effort. You know when I just gotten saved? Every time I prayed, it was like my, my answers would come when I have hardly finished praying. There was a season in God when everything was so simple. I would be praying here. The moment I walk out of the door, there is an answer. Then there came a time when suddenly it wasn't that easy anymore. You prayed and you wondered and you prayed again and you believed and you confessed and you were wondering what was happening. And I started thinking, maybe I missed God somewhere. Maybe I've backslidden. Maybe this. I did all sorts of troubleshooting. No. It was that when you have grown, there's effort involved. There's responsibility. He's now saying, "Uh uh-uh. Now you get get the word. Confess this word. Stand on this word. Confess it. Resist. Go. We are called to maturity. There must come a time when we get beyond these things. Hallelujah. You know when I just started operating in the miraculous, I used to pray all sorts of strange prayers. You go and you're like, Lord, you know the truth is I'm scared. You know, and you know, I had this habit. You go somewhere, then you pray in a language they don't know, so they don't hear the things you're actually saying in your prayer. So there's this blind guy, he's on the platform. And the truth is, you're in your, all within you. You're thinking, Lord, help me, because if this guy doesn't see, I'm going to be so embarrassed. So when you're praying, like, Lord, help me. Lord, please help me and just open their eyes. There came a time when he told me, Hello. You've been seeing me opening these eyes all along. What's your problem? Why are you still praying those prayers? What's wrong with you? And so I had to style up. Suddenly, now my prayers had to change. I had to pray like someone who'd grown. This morning, the scripture reading we had was in 1 Kings. Yes. About Elijah. You know the amazing thing about Elijah? He first goes to Ahab and tells him, I hear the sound of a mighty rain. After he has told him, I hear the sound of a mighty rain, then he goes to pray. And he puts his head between his knees and he prays. And keeps sending the servant. But remember, in the meantime, he has told the king, rain is coming. First time the servant comes back, man, there is no sign of any rain. Second time, third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time, no rain, no cloud, nothing, it's clear. In the meantime, remember, he's told the king, I hear the sound of a mighty rain. That's maturity. Faith calls the things which are not as though they are. When you have grown in God, you proclaim it. Because you're already sure, however many times you have to pray about it, it's going to come. Hallelujah. But note something about this. Sometimes what we do is we get these principles of maturity, then we apply them to our carnal things. These things were not meant for carnal stuff. Elijah was not praying for for some new brand new golden chariot for himself. He was praying for a nation. He was praying for rain for a nation. You know, it is, it is a shame when you spend, when you pray seven times and you're looking into the crowd, but what you want eh, is some petty personal thing. That's not maturity. You're still carnal at that point. Especially when it is to satisfy your own self. That's why James says, you receive not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask amiss, that you may satisfy your own lusts. So again, he's talking about immature people. They're self-focused, self-centered. I think the word they usually use is narcissistic. 
it's all about them. Maturity requires you to go beyond there. First Corinthians chapter 13. You know, a lot of the time we think, when you hear that chapter, the first thing that comes to your head is love, 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 love. But then verse 11, he says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. And now abides faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So here is the thing. Love is the foundation for maturity. Love is the foundation of maturity. When you're still young, it's all about you. When we were kids, we didn't really care. When you've become mature, suddenly it's about your spouse and your children. It's love. Hallelujah. You have moved beyond me, me, me to them, them, them. That's maturity. That's how love becomes the foundation for maturity. In order to get to the level of maturity, we must go beyond me, 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 to you, 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 Lord, your people, your purpose, your, your work. Amen. That's maturity. And you cannot get into maturity without love. That's why he first talks about love. He explains what love is. Then he says, when I was a child, I spoke. But he says, I, when I became a man, I put away childish things. That when I, he became an adult, he put away childish things. He put away the me, me, me. Now remember that chapter 12, beginning of the spirit is given unto all that they may what? Profit. So, the things he's talking about, they've gone beyond their personal profit thereof. And now he's saying, now you've come into the arena of love. It's no longer about you. That's why it begins with, and now I show you a more excellent way. Verse 31 in, in chapter 12 says, now I show you a more excellent way. He's saying, you know, after all these gifts and everything and powers and what and these things, now here is a more excellent way. Here is a mature way. Love. Because remember, the, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man for profit, 12.7. So, the more excellent way is when they have gone beyond their own profit. And now, they are loving. They've gone beyond, I have these gifts and I am profiting from them, to I have these gifts and because of love I'm using them to profit others. Ephesians chapter 3, from verse 16, it says, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height? So you cannot comprehend until you are rooted and grounded in love. I said, that you being rooted may be. So it's a conditional statement that for this to happen, that for the comprehending to happen, you must be rooted and grounded. Hallelujah. Being rooted and grounded. And says, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
So you cannot be filled with the fullness until you know the love. But what love are we talking about? You know, sometimes when we talk about the love of Christ, those who are young are thinking, oh, he loves me so much. Oh, he has loved me so much. That's not the love he's talking about. The love he's talking about is the other one where he says, love one another. The one where he says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friend. That's the love here. The love for others. The love for God's people. I remember it was 2002 and I was in an overnight. And this man of God in the midst of all his preaching turns around and he says, Noah. And I am in shock. And he says, Noah, the thing that will change your ministry is the day you learn to love his people the way he loves them. I said, huh? He says, when you learn to love God's people the way he loves them, your ministry will never be the same. And I remember one time, I was in a church, and there was this very gifted young man. Gifted, really gifted. He can worship. He had word of knowledge. And he was doing, you know, very gifted. Plays even instruments and all. Very gifted. And then the Lord tells me, tell him he doesn't need to struggle. Tell him it's not about, he doesn't have to put on an outer pretense. You know, sometimes we can be nice people, but we are nice on the outside. It's pretense. We are smiling and laughing at people's jokes, but we are not really. It's, yeah, we're just being nice. We are nice people. We're just nice. But it's not real. And the Lord was saying, tell him. Tell him. He needs to grow in love. That I, he, the Lord, that I will touch him. That if he can just get deeper in me, I will grow a real, a genuine love. Because, you see, you can be there and you're smiling with everyone and everyone says, what a nice guy. But you don't have love. And remember that he says, if you don't have love, you've just been wasting your time. So you'll be all this nice guy and you do all these things and what, but you've just wasted the time because you don't genuinely love people. One thing I learned is that the power of God and miracles flow out of compassion. And you cannot have compassion if you don't love people. Every time Jesus did a miracle, he was moved by compassion. When you don't feel for people the way God feels them, when you don't see them the way he sees them, you cannot be moved. And therefore the power of God just cannot operate through you. Because God can detect your phoniness from a mile away even when everyone else is fooled around you. Ephesians 4.15 says, But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, who is the head even Christ. Notice, again, he says, in love, when we Again, when we are operating in love, even when we speak the truth, even when we preach, we preach in love. We speak this truth in love. That's how we grow up into him. So your maturity is dependent on your love walk. Your maturity is dependent on how much you learn to walk in love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There comes a time when we have been rooted in our love that we no longer have to be taught about forgiving people. We've gone beyond that level. It's 
we, are, we walk in love. We don't have to be told about forgiving, about loving, about giving, because we walk in love. You see, when you've grown into maturity, no one needs to tell you about giving. Because it's an, it's, it's, it comes as a result of love. If you love God, you're going to give to him. If you love people, you're going to give to them. You can't see them in luck and you don't do something because you love them. But maturity comes from love. Are you mature? Or where are you? Are you unable to eat solid food because your love walk has not grown? Your love has not yet gone beyond yourself to others. And God knows us. That's why he started with us. He says, and the gifts are given to every man for profit. Because he knows they need to first love themselves. Then they can love others the same way they were loving themselves. So, some of us are still as love as you love yourself. But we have not yet said loving yet. We are still busy loving ourselves. But now, this morning, this afternoon, and whatever time it will be for those of you on YouTube, let us love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The love walk. Let us grow into maturity. Let's love one another. That is the foundation for maturity. And when we learn to do that, I can assure you we'll begin teaching some much deeper things here. The things I have wanted to teach for a while, and the Lord has been telling me, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. The deeper things, they are deep mysteries in the word that we can't teach. Remember, the Bible talks about, it says, what we've just read in Ephesians, what does it say? They are no longer as children, they are not tossed by every wind of doctrine. Deep things cannot be told to people who are still children because they will get confused. And when they get confused, they will misunderstand these things and do the wrong thing. Deep things are told to people who have reached a level of discernment. Hallelujah. You remember the scripture we read in Hebrews? What does it say? It says, who by reason of use by reason of exercise, they've reached a point of discerning between good and evil. Because when we get to deep things, it's no longer the preacher here telling you something. When we get to deep things, it is a sharing. Which means that the recipient has to be able to discern when the preacher is getting it wrong. That's why they say, these things are for those who by reason of use. By reason of use, they can discern good and evil. So that when I come and I'm going into some deep things here about Melchizedek, what, and I get it wrong, you can tell when I'm getting it wrong, then you come and tell me, ah, I think there you missed it. You're no longer blown. You have reached a level of maturity. And that's what happens to some people. They will come to church and they will find that the church has grown to a certain level, the rest of the people, and maybe they are visitors. And maybe the preacher is up there and he's talking about giving. You know, giving is controversial. That's why I want to use it as an example. And then what happens is for them, they don't understand. They've not reached the place of discerning. And so, what happens is, in their emotionalism, they get everything they own and everything and just go and give it. And then they start complaining. I gave my car, my house, what, everything to that ministry, and I am broke. God never did anything. Those people are liars. They take advantage. They had not grown. Because if they had grown, they would be able to listen and know which message is for them and which is not for them. They would be able to know whether that one is being said to them or to someone else. Because sometimes when we come to church, it is not that the word is wrong. It is that it's not yours.
Not every word that is spoken is yours. Sometimes an instruction is for someone else. But it's one person up here, and there's many people out there. So when you've gotten to the level of maturity, you know what's yours and what's not yours. There are many needs in this world. You know that? So many people suffering, so many people hungry, so many people starving. And you, as an individual, you don't have the means to deal with every need. So God knows which ones he has assigned you to meet and which ones he has not assigned you to meet. And maturity lets you know which is your assignment and which is not your assignment. It's someone else's. Maturity puts you in a place to be able to discern what's yours and what's not yours. He says, who by reason of use, by reason of exercise. Hallelujah. These muscles have to be exercised in order for them to work properly. Hallelujah. Let's stand up.